Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. lecture we continue our discussion on application of tridiagonal matrix algorithm. In the previous lecture we had discussed at length about how the tridiagonal matrix algorithm or the Thomas algorithm functions for a system of linear algebraic equations which can be laid in a tridiagonal form and we just would like to reiterate the fact that last time when we were discussing about the line gauss seidel iteration method that was the requirement. We needed the tridiagonal matrix algorithm to solve the problem. So, now that we understood the TDMA, we should now be able to apply it to solve this system of linear algebraic equations. As we discussed that we would solve the problem line by line, sweeping the domain from bottom to top or it could also be done from say west to east when we sweep column by column. The main message is that we could pick up a set of grid points lying along a particular line which could be disposed along the i direction or the j direction and solve the values of the function f at all such grid points lying on that particular line simultaneously and that would be possible through the TDMA. Having understood this, let us look at some other possible ways of solving elliptic partial differential equations. A very powerful method to accelerate convergence of solution of elliptic partial differential equations by iterative means is what is called as the point successive over relaxation method. So, we are coming back once again to iterative methods in between we looked at how we could solve a system of linear algebraic equations simultaneously to sweep domain line by line solving the functional values simultaneously, but we again come back and uh, relook at iterative methods here with a specific purpose of discussing a, partic a particular acceleration convergence tool which we call as over relaxation. So, earlier we had discussed about the fact that relaxation essentially means averaging of neighboring values. And what we mean by over relaxation is that whether we could accelerate this process, how do we go about doing that. So, how we do it mathematically is just by adding and subtracting f i j at the kth iteration level on the right hand side of the above equation and then rearranging the terms a little bit. So, what you can see is that what you have put as f i j k shows up here and minus f i j k has now been put inside the bracket and therefore, now has a coefficient minus 4 because you have a 1 fourth outside the bracket. So, therefore, they cancel each other. However, trivial this step may sound like it does a, a very significant change in the way you approach the algorithm. So, what it says is that as the iterations proceed, ideally f i j at the kth iteration level should be approaching the f i j at the k plus 1 th iteration level. And the sooner it achieves that transformation from the kth to k plus 1 th level, the sooner the iterations would converge. So, can you really expedite this process? So, the process expediting would then happen through what we call as the relaxation par parameter omega which we put over here. So, we are essentially multiplying the bracketed term with a factor omega so that we can send the bracketed term as quickly as possible to 0. What does that achieve for us? It achieves the fact that if it really reaches 0, then 
f i j at k plus 1 will approach f i j at k and that is essentially reaching convergence. So, the idea is to send this whole term to 0 as soon as possible by using omega to expedite the process. Now, the obvious question that arises in that case is how big can omega be so that you can expedite as much as you need to. So, from stability analysis we can actually show that the range of omegas that you can use to have a stable convergence of the solution lies anywhere between 0 and 2. So, if you use 0 then you are not essentially allowing the solution to progress at all. If you are using 2 you are accelerating it significantly, but you need to be just below 2 in general to keep the solution process stable. So, you can marginally keep it below 2 and then what you are then doing is what is called as over relaxation that means you are using a large value of omega in order to accelerate convergence. So, this happens to be a very very important tool in accelerating the convergence of when we solve uh, elliptic partial differential equations. Now, if we are using a omega value of 1 then we are essentially using Gauss zero. If we are using anything below 1 then we are under relaxing that means we are going slower than what Gauss Seidel does. And knowing the optimum value of omega is a difficult issue. So, most often for specific equations and specific problem scenarios you would actually have to do some numerical experiments before you get to know what the optimum value of omega is. So, there is usually no a priori prescription for an optimum omega. Now, that we understood the idea of point successive over relaxation, you can think of doing it line by line. What we had done for the line Gauss serial iteration method earlier, where we applied TDMA to solve the problem, you could now incorporate omega into the equation by doing a very simple rearrangement like the one we did for point successive over relaxation that we just added and subtracted f i j k on the right hand side of the equation. You can do this exercise yourself and then show that you end up getting an equation of this kind where you now have a control over how quickly these iterations would converge. So, you can again end up using the same range of values for omega based on the prescribed constraint and of course, if you are looking for over relaxation it should be lying within a range like this. So, this would accelerate your solution. So, this of course, involves simultaneous solution of the functional values line by line that is either rows or columns. So, row by row sweeping the entire domain or column by column sweeping the entire domain and since it would involve several iterations you can do it in an alternate manner in order to remove bias in most cases. We would like to discuss another very very powerful algorithm for solving elliptic partial differential equations which is called as the alternating direction implicit scheme. In the literature it is often referred to as the ADI scheme. What is the solution strategy in this case? Let us draw a simple diagram to explain what ADI scheme essentially does. So, we are essentially drawing a grid to represent your grid points at let us say the kth iteration level. And then our aim is to take the solution to the k plus 1th iteration level. That means, the functional values at the inner grid points would then change and reach the k plus 1th level. As we do that, we actually split up the whole process into two sub steps. So, 
like we have marked the k -th level and the k plus 1 -th level, we would mark an intermediate level which we call as k plus half level. And now we need to figure out what we would like to do with these three levels. Of course, the solution is already available to you at the kth level, that is the assumption. <coughs> so, once that is available to you, what you first do is in the k plus half level, you do what is called as a x sweep. What do we mean by a x sweep? Like we were talking about the line by so line solution of the system of equations, here we just take the grid points row wise. So, in this row you would take these two grid points and solve for their values. Once you solve them, you move up and you solve for the next row and so on. So, if that is the case, how would the governing equation in discrete form look like? Let us see this first equation. So, in this first equation, we have taken the grid points along the i direction. So, you have i minus 1, i and i plus 1 and the level of iteration that you have mentioned here is k plus half for all of them. What do you have on the right hand side? You have the functional values along the j direction. So, you have j plus 1 and j minus 1 and j minus 1 has already been updated because you are sweeping the domain row wise. So, you have swept through the j minus 1 row already and reached j. Therefore, you have an updated value here, but j plus 1 is yet to be reached and therefore, it remains at the kth level value. Since these are known to you, they are sent to the right hand side. Now, what will this do? This will generate a system of linear algebraic equations in every row which is specified by a certain j. And therefore, you will have a tri diagonal system of equations to be solved, which will be managed through application of TDMA. So, what are we doing in this step essentially? We are reaching the solution as though by half a step, by sweeping the entire domain, by doing x sweeps. And then in the next half portion of the iteration, we will come back and we will do the y sweeps. So, in that case, the y sweep would be represented by the second equation, where if we look at the left hand side terms they are now reaching the k plus 1 th iteration level and they are points disposed along the y direction or the j direction. So, you have j minus 1, j and j plus 1. What you have on the right hand side are values which have reached at least k plus half level or even k plus 1 level. So, k plus 1 level has been reached by which which uh, grid point? It is the i minus 1 j grid point because you are sweeping by the column wise values. So, by the time you came up to the i value, you have already swept through the column of i minus 1 and therefore, that has already reached the k plus 1 th level while you are yet to reach the column which has an indexed i plus 1 because that lies to your left sorry lies to your right if you are sweeping from left to right. And therefore, it remains at the k plus half iteration level which you had completed through the x sweeps. So, that is the manner in which we interpret what is available on the right hand side of the discretized equation in the y sweep. So, we understand that the first equation stands for the x sweep, the second equation stands for the y sweep and once you have completed the full round of x sweep and y sweeps, then you have essentially moved the solution from the kth to the k plus 
oneth iteration level. So, this is the strategy by which we split the direction of the sweep and therefore, take the sweeps along two respective Cartesian directions separately, one in succession of the other and therefore, reach the next iteration level. One big advantage that we gain out of it is that if we were to do it in one step, then we would have to handle a penta diagonal coefficient matrix, which we have discussed in the previous lecture. While in this case, because we are splitting the directions and sweeping them, we have managed to solve two sequential tri diagonal matrix based problems in the two sweeps. So, that adds big convenience in the sense that we have a very, very effective TDM algorithm doing this job for us in two sequential sweeps. We would like to go back and solve a simple numerical problem. We recall about the problem that we were solving on a square domain with temperatures defined along the different boundaries. In the previous case, we had considered Dirichlet boundary condition along all the boundaries. In this case, we will briefly look at what is the change in the calculations if you were to change the boundary condition at only one of the boundaries. So, we have defined this problem as a mixed Dirichlet Neumann problem. So, we have Dirichlet conditions in east, west and north and a Neumann condition of 0 normal gradient of f in the south boundary. So, what is the impact on the solution? We recall having obtained an expression for the first order derivative in the form of a one sided finite difference expression earlier. involving three grid points. So, that expression will come in handy over here in order to define the functional value at any grid point lying on the south boundary. Now, that you have a Neumann boundary condition, you have to apply a finite difference approximation of this derivative and set it to 0 at the south boundary in order to get an expression for f of i 1, where i varies from the minimum to the maximum range. If you have done that, then this can help you start the computations in this manner. So, for example, you have to guess interior grid point values as usual. So, let us continue with the old approximation of 200 degree centigrade for the interior grid points and which are our points. If you recall, there were 4 points 2 2 3 2 2 3 and 3 3. These were the interior grid points. Let us guess their values as this as we did previously. This time, we have to also guess values at the lower boundary points or the south boundary points. So, let us apply that finite difference formula in order to estimate them. So, both turn out to be 200 degree centigrade. So, this is the initial guess and 
you may remember that all the initial gases were marked with a zero iteration level. Having said that, we continue with the iterative formula coming from the Jacobi method. Of course, now we know that we can have much better methods to do these calculations, but we are just sticking to the old formula in order to just compare between what we saw happening with our Dirichlet based boundary conditions and, and now the mixed Dirichlet Neumann boundary conditions. So, in the first iteration, let us see how the values change. So, we go to the interior grid points and we use this formula for each grid point and try to work out the values. So, the calculations are routine calculations, only difference in this case was that in the boundary where we applied the Neumann condition, we applied a finite di difference expression for the derivative to compute the functional value. So, that was different from how it was for a Dirichlet condition, because for a Dirichlet condition the functional value was directly available. Here we have to compute it and then of course, it depends on the order of accuracy of the scheme that you are using to compute it. So, in this case we have used a three point stencil based formula which is second order accurate. You could use other schemes and check for yourself how they work out when you try to use different orders of approximation. So, this will turn out to be 200 degree centigrade and now we are left with the point 33. this will turn out to be 275 degree centigrade. So, this is the first iteration level and if you check with what you got with the pure Dirichlet boundary condition, the numbers would be quite different. Just by changing one of the boundary conditions, the values would change significantly that you can check later. Let us go to the second iteration and see what happens. If you remember with the complete Dirichlet boundary conditions, we could reach convergence in just one step, because the second iteration step essentially confirmed that we had reached convergence already. So, here is it that way. So, in the second iteration, first thing we will do is, we will update the boundary conditions for the lower boundary points at the end of the first iteration without which we would not be able to compute the second, second iteration level. So, what we are doing now is essentially part of the first iteration itself before we can start doing the second iterations. So, this will turn out to be 167 degrees in a similar manner F 3 1 dash will turn out to be 242 degrees. So, this is part of the first iteration itself. So, what we did was that we iterated the inner grid point values in the first iteration level and used those values to update the boundary values at the south boundary at the end of the first iteration, getting ready to initiate our second iteration. So, in the second iteration, if you do repeat the calculations, now with updated values of the uh, inner grid points and the updated value of the south boundary grid points, you will be able to see that this becomes 179, this is 273,
and at the end of the second iteration when you update the values of the south boundary points they will turn out to be 168 and 268 respectively. And if you compare between the first iteration and second iteration levels, you can make out that the values have not converged. They are different in the second iteration as compared to the first iteration, which indicates that we have to go for more iterations subsequently. And then if you were to do another iteration, let us quickly look at the results what that will produce. Third iteration would produce F 2 2 at third iteration equal to 189, 3 2, 284. Now, if you compare again all of them still continue to change. Which means it will take us more iterations to converge. Now, the message from this exercise essentially is that we had made a comment that if you have purely Dirichlet based boundary conditions, then it is usually it takes less number of iterations to reach convergence compared to boundary conditions where you have mixed Dirichlet Neumann. And through this simple problem that we had set out to solve last time with a pure Dirichlet boundary condition where we could reach convergence in just one iteration. Here we found that even with three iterations, we do not seem to be fairly close to the convergence. There could be more changes coming over the next few rounds of iterations before we actually reach convergence. So, as a practical exercise, one can write a simple computer code to do these iterations in a recursive manner and then finally, reach convergence and then check for convergence whether we are able to satisfy a particular convergence criteria. But in general, presence of a Neumann boundary in one of the four boundary conditions seem to bring in a lot of change not only to the numbers how they vary in the domain, but also on the convergence characteristics of the solution. So, you may have noticed that now that you have imposed the south boundary as a Neumann boundary, the temperatures in general are rising at that boundary. Last time it was just 0 degree centigrade at the south boundary and this time you notice that the south boundary temperatures are way higher compared to what it was last time. So, the two grid points that you have at the boundary are showing 180 and 280 degree centigrade. To reach the zero gradient condition, the temperature seems to be rising there. It will later on saturate and then reach an equilibrium distribution, but it seems to be taking more iterations. So, with this we complete our discussion on elliptic partial differential equations. Thank you.